Yeah. So it's nice to, it, to be here today. Thanks for taking the time. That's good. Welcome to Shelf Life. I'm Arlen Hess. My guest today is Edward Banks, author of Heavy Metal Africa, Life, Passion, and Heavy Metal in the Forgotten Continent. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Tell me which came first, your love for Africa or your love for metal? Metal, heavy metal. Grade school, started with grade school, and then it kind of it built itself through, through middle school, and then high school became an obsession. Yeah. And then going I, to concerts and going, yeah, hanging out backstage could, yeah. or at the door. And of course, when I, yeah, as an adult, that's, it consumes a lot of my time and money. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a passion for sure. It's an identity, so yeah, you can't scratch that away from me. It's just, I'm a metalhead. <laughs> Proudly so. How did Africa come into the picture? As an adult, I, I have an obsession with Africa. Ever since I was a kid, though, I was always a, I was always interested in how other people around the world live. I, um, I grew up in central Pennsylvania, and you realize that uh, you don't know much about the rest of, well, any, anywhere else. I think my mom kept us grounded in, because um, my mom being from Puerto Rico, oh, we had a different, um, our upbringing was a little more uh, cosmopolitan, like small town cosmopolitan, per se. Mm. And she would take us to Puerto Rico. And um, early on in our life, uh, we lived in Spain for four years. So you had that little taste of what elsewhere was like. Mm. And then um, I, I always took an interest in things more. Uh, I, I share the story in the book about pouring over a, an atlas that my mother had. And I always just looked at the maps and whatnot and realized I didn't know much about the rest of the world. And then. Mm. As an adult, uh, it really just took full stride. I think September 11th had something to do with that. How so? Because you, you really uh, understand you don't know. I, I didn't know much about the world. You yeah, think you do, yeah, but, you but you don't. And um, everyone's constantly telling you about other places, but it's not really. I never thought it was an accurate portrayal. And then meeting people from other corners of the world that you, you're exposed to, you realize you, you don't know much. But Africa just consumed me. Um, just became, that really, probably about 24, 25 years old, it became an obsession. Mm. And I could not, anything that had Africa, any book that said the word Africa in it, I was buying, I was reading, mm. any movie I could watch, any little documentary. And then um, when I started to travel there, it really just hit me. That was it, full stride. So you traveled to Africa before you went and got your master's? Yeah, I was an undergrad. First time I went to Africa, I was an undergraduate student. Um, I used to play in a touring heavy metal band, true story. <laughs> and um, I would, um, Believe it. I was, um, I had all this musical equipment, musical gear, mm -hmm. and I ended up actually selling it for my first airline ticket to wow. Africa. My first trip was in 2007. Oh, wow. And I went to Zimbabwe. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so that, that was it. Once I got back, I was, I was full on stride. I was a political science major, but then I tied everything I could into Africa, and my professors were very um, uh, cool about it. They, they allowed me to just focus my essays on Africa, even mm -hmm. though there was no African studies or politics classes at the school I went to. Mm -hmm. But I was able to transfer all that into my graduate studies. Tell me more about your graduate studies, because that's, that's how you were finally able to blend these two things together. Yes. I went to uh, the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. Mm -hmm. I got a, a master's degree in African Studies. My focus was on post-colonial politics. Mm -hmm. And because um, I was now going to Africa as often as I could, which ended up being uh, every year, every other year early mm -hmm. on, because you know it's, it's, these aren't cheap trips. And right. I'm still I'm still a working guy. Right. But um, I would find myself just wanting to get more into the political world of, of Africa. But I was um, on a trip to Cape Town. I met a guy who was a metalhead, and we ended up having a great conversation. And I kept in touch with him. But through subsequent trips, I was exposed more into Cape Town's heavy metal scene. And when I was in graduate school in London, England, um, I was in part of the London metal scene as well. And um, I was at a, a pub that's a metal pub in London. And I was asked if I knew anything about Africa's heavy metal scene. Because he said, you know a lot about Africa and you're a metal fan. Do you know what's going on in Africa's metal scene? And it was a question I really couldn't answer as accurately as I wanted to. Mm. So I just started to dig into it a little more. And it turned into this. <laughs> It was supposed to, I thought maybe I could write an article or something about it, but then it just ended up being a whole book because there was a whole world I didn't even know about. And it, through conversations and meeting bloggers and talking to them on the internet, it just happened. I'm not a metal fan. Yeah. But I, what draws me to this book is the travel narrative, is the, uh, the, the journey into yourself. Sure. And the people that you meet and, the stor and their stories, the stories that you tell. Yeah. It was the only natural way I could figure to write the book. It was the only comfortable way, I should say. Yeah. It was, um, 
I could write a book about heavy metal music, but you not. It just there it, are books it, about heavy metal music. Yeah, right. It just didn't feel right. Right. It just didn't. It didn't feel right because I needed to. I I don't think a readership would know, and I wasn't trying to be ignorant, but I don't think people actually understand Africa. So I wanted to tell it to them, and I, the first drafts of the book weren't with me involved with Africa, mm -hmm. like a, 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 on the ground. It was just. Uh, stories, mm -hmm. um, and it was just more of a setup. I would say it was a little more academic mm -hmm. at first, and it just didn't feel comfortable yet. And then um, after a bit, it just it just felt right. And once I started to put myself in the book and started right. to relay the stories, then everything became different. Right. Because the conversations I had with the musicians on the ground were entirely organic. I had my little ten question standard things that I was asking the people, and it just it just that didn't feel right either. And then once I started to I push record the first interview I did. Mm -hmm. I'd send emails out first, but then when I was in um, Johannesburg, the very first interview I did for the book, um, it was it was funny. We met at a pub. This guy and um, his name was Shane, and we two drinks in. He said he wanted to get comfortable, and it, those two drinks helped him just just go. Right. And um, he immediately started to tell me about what what it was really like growing up under apartheid and being a white. Uh, in South Africa during apartheid and the privilege that he understood he had, mm -hmm. but how he just felt so wrong about it. Because mm -hmm. there were still things that you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And I just like, whoa, I didn't even know the, some of these things he was telling me. And you think right. you could learn everything through books, but, it, but once you, you, you get anecdotes, it's completely right. different. And um, that's what completely changed the narrative yeah. too. Yeah, right. Right, so like, that's why the traveling was more important to me. One, once I was there on the ground, it changed everything. And as a reader, that's, I was able to experience this all through your eyes. You were yeah. as a as a narrator, as a storyteller, and a, a reader might not think that this is a story, but there is a story here. There is a story, yeah. yeah. But it, it had to it because it came personal, and I think I do a good job in the introduction of the book relaying how personal Africa is to me, but how more of a personal experience it becomes mm -hmm. once you you spend a lot of time. And I didn't stay in hotel rooms and and go back to a hotel every night. I stayed with the musicians, right. and I traveled with them, and I lived the way that they did. And if they were struggling for food, yeah, I had I had cash with me, but I was a part of their struggle for it. Like mm -hmm. in Madagascar, that's why that became so personal. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, I don't have electricity now. We don't have electricity for three nights. How are we gonna do this? I don't have a running, we don't have running water where I'm staying, so how are we gonna get by? But I see how they did it. And yeah, it was it was uncomfortable, but it was, it was seven weeks for me. Mm -hmm. It was their lifetime. Right. So it was, it was a different perspective on everything. And so it became personal and it, I, I had to, but the things that happened to me, for better, for worse, there was, there's, there's, there's funny parts in the book. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I know people tell, share some stories, like you, you really got a craving through or of orange soda because <laughs> of malaria. I was like, it was, it, was a, it, was an odd, it was an odd thing that happened, mm -hmm. but I had to relay that because yeah. It, it, yeah, it's just. It's and that pulls me in, that pulled me in as a, as a, as a reader because I've traveled and yeah. sometimes, you know, for me, because I'm not a metal fan. Sometimes y you don't mention metal for pages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're just talking about the people. And I and I think that that's that's fascinating. It was the metal that got you there. Yeah. Um, but it was the people that kept you there. Well, music became the gateway in. Yeah. I, I thought that learning about politics teaches you certain things, and you study you know you study political history and whatnot. But that really only teaches you about the history of the countries. If you really, to me, I felt that the best way in was a way I never even knew I could, I could enter a country with or enter a country's culture, it was through music. And I ended up learning a lot about local music, traditional music, um, and how that plays in and how the relationship that metal fans have. And it's nice to see that metal fans are the, the same way all over the all world. All over the world. Yeah. Um, tell us, tell me which countries that you focus on in the book and how you chose those countries. Um, first countries, uh, South Africa, Botswana, uh, Kenya, Madagascar, Mauritius, and uh, Reunion Island. I tied that in one chapter, and in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. uh, it was originally intended to be Angola, but I couldn't get a visa to get in, so I went to Zimbabwe, which it's okay. I've, I've been there before, and I really love that place. Mm -hmm. And I went to Namibia, but I didn't, it's actually not included in the book. Why not? Uh, it, just, it just didn't feel right, mm -hmm. didn't fit. Um, it was a, it's a beautiful country, cool people, had some great conversations, but it, um, it, it just, I don't know, it, ju it just didn't fit the whole narrative of the book. Mm -hmm. And there's really nothing. Yeah, Namibia is a good, good country, which is good. But maybe for some, some it didn't other work time. For the book. I mean, no, it didn't, it didn't it work, work for. The it just didn't right. feel right. Uh, that's what, what our, an artistic yeah. work is like. How long did it take you to write the book? Five years, five years from beginning to end. 
and the countries were chosen because of um, uh, just my connection, internet first with, with um, like internet emails. Mm. Well, that's redundant, but sending emails to, to Cape Town and it started there and it exposed myself. Um, like the country surprised me, I think, with Madagascar. Mm -hmm. I think I only knew like one or a handful of bands, but then, wow. Right. It's a network. Yeah. Once you connect with somebody, again, it explodes. Once I was there, it was completely different. Had I just stayed from afar, I could have done this on a, in a kitchen table in, in Florida or in Pennsylvania. And it, it just, yeah, it wouldn't have been, the experience was not there. Mm -hmm. And I would never have known of half the bands. No, right. Yeah. No, no, no. You had to be on the ground to, yeah. to get to know you realize what they know. Yeah, you realize when you live in Madagascar, you just don't set up Facebook pages and have Twitter accounts. And it's just not that easy for you right. to put music up and say, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, oh, so different than it is here. Yeah. Um, who was your intended audience for this book? Well, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. You think in your head, you you internalize it as I'm going to write this for metal fans, mm -hmm. but and metal people that had an interest in, in maybe rock music too. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to bring in people in Africa. Yeah. I really wanted a broad readership, so I was hoping that maybe even middle school kids can pick it up. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I wrote it accordingly. So, but um, it's an easy read. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. It's um. I wanted, I wanted everyone. I wanted people who were interested in Africa, people who were interested in traveling, people who were interested in history and politics. And I think I touch up on a lot of different yeah, things, issue-based things. I talk, talk about HIV and AIDS mm -hmm. in Botswana. I talk about a ethnic identity in Kenya, poverty in Madagascar, uh, the, the political situation in Zimbabwe, which is no more, thankfully. Right, yeah. right. Well, and so that leads into my next question. How have things changed, either in Africa, in these particular countries, or with these musician situations since you started writing? I think well, Zimbabwe changed for the best, yeah. but it's still always, this is the gray area of, of, of a post-dictator transition. Mm -hmm. You know, elections are coming, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. I'm always, I'm always that, when it happens, uh, only, only if it happens do I believe it happens right. with, with some of these political situations. Um, I mean, I still talk to just about every single musician in there. You know, things are, things are fine. Some of the bands have actually benefited from the exposure of the book. They're getting international press. There's been uh, international magazines that they were just, oh my gosh, we're yeah. actually in Metal Hammer. Like, this is unreal. Yeah. Uh, they've been getting television exposure in, in, in some instances. So it, things are for the best. As have you. Yes. I mean, this book has taken on a yeah. life of its own. It's got a lot of legs. You've been doing the conference circuit through Europe. You've yeah. got some conferences here. Yeah, this week in a You've conference. You've done yeah. some national interviews. I have. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I got I got to be on um, WNYU at New York's uh, NPR affiliate, mm -hmm. and, by, and it was interviewed by Jonathan Capehart, which was just like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I watch this guy on television. I read his, his stuff. That was that was really cool. That opened me up to a whole new audience. I didn't. Again, it was. What am I doing on NPR talking about heavy metal? And there I was. It was because it was about the Africa thing, and he was fascinated by that. Uh, too, um, and that that changed. Uh, it wasn't just the metal press that jumped on board. Right. That's what I was I was moved by. Even even African um, news agencies and whatnot started to say, "Well, wait a second. We didn't even know we had these bands in our countries." Mm -hmm. So I was like, "Yeah." And and for them now, they're getting more exposure in their countries. Especially Kenya, I think, has really benefited from this because now they have international bands that are coming in. I don't necessarily know that everyone knows about the book, but you know, you, you keep fighting, but. It, it's there. It's not a resource for like you know what bands and whatnot. You meet a lot of bands. It's though it's not it's not like a list of here's the bands, here's how to contact right. them. But uh, you can put things together. But they they were benefiting. I mean, Channel Four from France went to Kenya, and uh, CNN went to Kenya, and it was like, oh, we got to talk to these rock and metal bands now. That's great. So it's been great. Yeah. Will you read a little piece from the book for us? Sure. Um, I selected this passage. It's not very long, but I, I I'm s selecting this for a reason because. Mm -hmm. There's a point in early on where you just you start to question w why I'm there, and it takes a toll on you personally. Uh, early on, even right away, because you're you're gone for so long, and, and I'm not working at home. I'm not making money. I'm just I have the money that I have, and it's going to last me till right. till, I, till it needs to. But I was um, because of what I shared with you earlier from my trip to South Africa. It was everything everything I thought I knew. I knew a little. Just I knew this much. It was just a tincture of my knowledge on Africa. Everything right. else changes when you're meeting so many people, especially through apartheid, mm -hmm. and how it's experiencing apartheid. And I met blacks and whites of all different ages, uh, the post-apartheid and the pre-apart, uh, you know, in the apartheid generation that got to share their stories with me, and I learned some really interesting things. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I'm in a road trip here, 
We're driving from Johannesburg to Cape Town, which is about almost a, I would say 18 to 20 hour drive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I did it all in one day with my friend Herman. Uh, I was on tour with his band Juggernaut. It was a fascinating trip. But there's a part in the middle of the country where we're at here in the Karoo. I like this picture, yeah. Which is, which is good, but I'm gonna pick okay. it up in the middle. So we're in his uh, little <laughs> pickup truck with no air conditioner driving through a desert. <laughs> Great, okay. <clears throat> These mountains look scary, I said, breaking the silence. Herman just laughed, as anyone would have, I'm sure. This is what Middle Earth must look like, referring to the Lord of the Rings book and film series. Herman agreed, nodding his head, reminding me that the acclaimed and treasured author of the series, J.R.R. Tolkien, actually grew up in South Africa, not far from where we were passing at the time. Staring at the Swatberg Mountains and their ominous nature, I wondered if this is where Tolkien envisioned his fictitious world, where people of different groups lived separately with separate languages and separate identities and seldom interacted. I was not then, nor am I now, well-versed on his works, but I could not help but think that his fantasy world was not very different from the realities of the South Africa that surrounded him. Those rocky, frightening peaks jutting out of the dry sands of the desert consumed me for the remainder of the sunlight. For as long as those mountains were in front of us, we were silent, consumed in our thoughts. When I would break the silence, I could come, kept coming back to this country's history. Perhaps Herman was annoyed by my insistence of always discussing the past, but this is what was persistent in my thoughts. If there is anything that sets South Africa apart, it's its complexity, he remarked during one of my inquiries. Perhaps this is what Tolkien understood as he was able to channel that complexity into his art, much like the musicians who make up this complicated and diverse landscape. Everyone is alive under one collective, aware of their differences, divided by forces, seen and unseen, yet working together. The complications of the country came to live in everyone. Perhaps this is why the mid-90s was a crucial time in the country's creative history. All artists found a way of unleashing that complexity with painters, writers, and musicians releasing a collective frustration. Herman was right. South Africa was complicated, and perhaps still remains that way. Now I had a reason to be silent. I learned so much of the country's history through academia, but was unable to understand the true complications of a nation undergoing a new identity. Music was my way of better understanding this. Yeah, a little passage, short Welcome. passage. But it was, um, it was important, like I said, it was important to travel. And once I did it, it was, yeah. Very good. So um, what's next for Heavy Metal Africa? Well, um, the book's doing <laughs> far better than I ever thought it would. <laughs> it definitely exceeded my expectations, and I'm not complaining. I'm very no, happy. No, no, not complaining And thank at you all. to everyone right. out there who supported it. Um, I'm, I'm working on a, on a new book, similar, um, subject, but it, this one is definitely going to be far more about academic. About Africa or about heavy metal? About heavy metal in Africa, yeah. Oh, in heavy metal in Africa, yeah. okay. It's okay. going to be, it's an academic work, so it's no no travel essays and whatnot. It's, we're going to do more issue focus. It will be peer reviewed. Oh, wow. okay. we're, I'm going to break into more uh, post-colonial identity. Using the degrees. Yes, right. uh, yeah, I guess I guess it flex my brain a bit. <laughs> be a little more pedantic. Now you have to really yeah. work. And no use one, larger words, no right? No more just headbanging. Yeah, no more just headbanging. We're going to talk about gender, we're going to talk about um, uh, race, uh, things that I, I mean, I, I talk about it in modicum throughout the book, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. really now with a more academic focus, peer reviewed, uh, and you know, academic support. So that's going to be exciting. I'm it's going to take some time, but it's I'm, very exciting. I'm, yeah, I'm very exciting that that all happened because of this. Nice. So, um, you know, uh, that's exciting. And then with this, with this particular book, may, maybe we'll do a second version in the future. I still want to go to Angola and mm -hmm. even North Africa. Oh, nice. But I don't want to get too carried away with it, you know. Right, right. You don't want to overdo too much. No, I don't want to do overdo it. And I'm still speaking. I'm still traveling and speaking. So, how can people get in touch with you? you follow you on Twitter? Yeah, Twitter at Heavy Metal Africa or um, at Edward Banks B A N C H S. Uh, Facebook page for Heavy Metal Africa. Instagram. Great. Um, it's all. It's all there. I'm easy to reach. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, I hope when you've got some other projects, you'll come back and talk to us. I hope so. All right. Thank Great. you very much. No, thank you for being here. Yes. Um, you are watching Shelf Life with Arlen Hess. Uh, my guest today has been Edward Banks, author of Heavy Metal Africa, Life, Passion, and Heavy Metal in the Forgotten Continent. Shelf Life is a production of PCTV 21 and City Books, located at 908 Galveston Avenue on Pittsburgh's north side. You can check out our website at www.citybookspgh.com. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram and Twitter at C
City Books PGH. Thanks for watching.